Um, so hi everyone and welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Maggie Vistra and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. So this series is sponsored by NOAA's Office of Education, which is where I work, along with the National Sea Grant College Program, and it's supported by Woods Hole Sea Grant and NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, that's N-O-A-A, -A, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, we are introducing to you Jess Brown with NOAA's Georgia Sea Grant in Brunswick, Georgia. Jess will be talking about stormwater and how scientists and engineers are working to mimic nature to catch rainwater using green infrastructure. Before we start, uh, we'd like to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional knowledge to share with us. We acknowledge that Jess is coming to us from the land of the Muskegee and Creek peoples. We are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Piscataway Kanoi tribe of the Piscataway Indian Nation. I also want to extend a special thank you to our American Sign Language interpreter, Crystal Butler. Thank you, Crystal. A few guidelines before I hand you over to Jess. You're all muted. However, there's a chat box where you can write questions and we encourage you to do so as we go along. If, you don't, if we don't get to your question today during the webinar, no worries. Uh, we will give you some resources so you can look things up after the webinar. Also, Jess has graciously agreed to answer questions we don't get to, and we'll be posting the answers along with the recording of today's webinar on our website. Uh, Jess is also going to have some questions for, for you throughout the webinar, so get ready to type. Um, Jess is going to do a quick activity today during her talk, and so if you'd like to participate, uh, you'll need to get a piece of paper, two colored markers, and a spray bottle of water or a glass of water in a container to catch some leftover water. And you might need some towels if you spill. So I'll give you a few seconds here to go grab those supplies if you're interested. All right, I hope you got your materials. You can also watch Jess do the activity um, and do it later um, with the recording. All right, um, I'm all set. So I'm gonna turn it now over to Jess, take it away. Thanks, Maggie. I am really looking forward to sharing with you all about some of the work that I do to protect our water resources. But before we learn a little bit about stormwater, I thought I'd first share a little bit about myself. So Maggie mentioned I work for uh, Sea Grant, which is a big network of programs at colleges and universities. I work at the University of Georgia, and our team has scientists, researchers, and teachers working on just about everything to do with the coastal environment. Oops. So I mentioned uh, we're here in Georgia. You can see from the map that Georgia is down in the southeastern corner of the United States, um, right in the middle of the pile of southern states. Georgia has a really small coast, only about 100 miles in length, but we've got a lot of things going on and several offices, labs, and education facilities. It's really easy for me to travel up and down our coast, but my office is here in the southern corner in the city of Brunswick. So I'm a water resources engineer, and water resources engineers like to design systems for people to use and manage water. I haven't always known what I wanted to do. Um, actually, as a kid, I used to be really scared that someone would ask me that question of what I uh, wanted to do when I grew up. I had absolutely no idea. Uh, but there are a few things that I've always loved. The first, uh, being outside, playing with my sister or going on a hike, like this picture here on the left with my dad. Um, I've always really enjoyed being outside. I've also enjoyed being part of a team. This middle picture is a picture of my basketball team. Um, this is a little bit later when I was in high school, but we started to play together starting in the fifth grade. Um, and one of the neat things about that team is while we all had really different strengths and things that we did well in the court, um, uh, we were able to come together and it would made it more fun to play as a team. 
And last, I've always loved to learn and create. This photo here on the right is a photo of me and my best friend, Brian. Uh, we were always building and creating things with blocks and Play-Doh, food and dirt. Um, we just really like to create stuff and learn how it might uh, work a little bit better. It took us a long time to figure out how to balance these wooden tiles so that we could build such a really tall tower. And the reason I'm sharing this today is these are all still things that I like and still things that are part of my job as a water resources engineer um, and working at the University of Georgia. I spend a lot of time outside. Here you can see uh, me laying out some coconut fiber to prevent erosion, or down here I'm getting ready to count some bugs in the creek. Um, also get a chance to be part of many teams, design teams that do calculations and models like the ones that you see on the screen. Um, but I also have the chance to learn and get to create uh, lots of new projects. And I'm gonna share a few more of those projects with you all a little bit later today. All right, so we're going to switch gears from talking about me to talking about rain. So, uh, but if you have more questions about me, feel free to chat, to put those in the chat. So let's take a second, and I want you to remember a time that it rained. Maybe this was a time recently, or maybe it was a really big storm you remember. Um, but imagine being a raindrop, and think about um, as you fall from the sky, what might happen? When it rains, the raindrops have a few paths and different directions that they can go. Some raindrops get used by the plants, others can get absorbed into the ground. This process is actually called infiltration. The ground can just soak us right up. Um, other raindrops evaporate and go back to the sky. And some raindrops, though, fall on surfaces that can't soak them up. And so they collect with other raindrops and run off. Stormwater is that rain, or, the, or it can also be water from melting snow or ice um, that can actually, it's that water that be can become runoff because it falls on a surface that can't absorb it. A surface that can't absorb water is called an impervious surface. So this will be the first chance you have to use the chat. Um, what sort of impervious surfaces cause, um, or what are some of the impervious surfaces that uh, you can think of? Uh, feel free to go ahead and type those into the chat. Yeah, please, please get your fingers ready and um, type those answers. So Theodore says concrete, and Nicole is saying roads. Uh, Texas says glass and cement. Michelle says the sidewalk. Lots of great answers here. Wow, um, yeah, those are really good ones. Dominic saying wood. Maria says plastic. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah, lots of good answers. So concrete and cement and sidewalks and plastic, wood. A lot of great answers. Super, yeah. So those are all really good examples of impervious surfaces. They all cause water to collect and run off. Um, and the reason that we're interested in impervious surfaces is that stormwater, the water that runs off, can create some challenges. The first one, um, or the first challenge, is flooding. So when we have a lot of stormwater that collects, it can cause flooding and flood our roads and our homes, um, and that can cause some really negative, awful impacts. Um, flooding can cause a lot of damages. So as scientists and engineers, we have to think about how to handle this large quantity of water or flooding. And you can see some pictures on the left-hand side of the screen of flooding. Um, but stormwater also runs across the land um, and as it runs over the land it collects and and runs over those impervious surfaces and while it's running over it picks up pollutants pollutants like pathogens from pet waste that wasn't picked up or things that leak from your car like hydrocarbons or oil um, it can also pick up fertilizer or sediment and even trash on its way as it's making its way to the nearest creek or estuary Oftentimes in a city, um, I think Dominic's living in the Bronx is what Maggie mentioned earlier. There's lots of folks from other cities. As water is moving over the pavement, it actually, or other types of impervious surface, um, it can actually get hotter because it transfers the temperature um, from those. 
surfaces. These kind of pollutants are called non-point source pollutants. They're non-point because we can't actually point to one single thing that causes the pollutants in the water. Non-point source pollutants are a collection of pollutants from a large area. So if we think about sediment, sediment or soil could actually be coming from any one of those places on the on the screen it could and be transferred to the creek so it could be coming from the cropland here on the right or maybe even a construction site in the city or in this suburban development um, or we could even be getting some sediment from erosion um, on a hill up in the forest land so it can be coming from a, a lots of different places throughout the, the watershed or across the landscape and that brings us to the example that I wanted to share today. So I wanted to show you a bit more about non-point source pollutants uh, by using this example. Um, Maggie mentioned you can do this at home too if you have the materials, or you might just wanna watch and come back a little bit later um, once you have those things available. You'll need a few pieces of paper, um, at least a couple of different colored markers and some water. Uh, I advise at home, you can do this over a sink or a bowl uh, and use a cup of water. You can also use a cookie sheet, um, but I'm gonna be using this spray bottle and this pan in my office. So the first thing you want to do, actually let me stop sharing my screen so you can see a little bit more. Of the example. So first thing you want to do is grab your piece of paper and you can see I've prepped this one but you'll want to crumple up or fold the piece of paper and you can pretend that this is our landscape. I am not an artist I've rem um, so I've just sketched a few things in here but you can see we have a river. I drew the ocean because I live near the ocean but we have the city maybe even a development you can draw those things in, but the most important thing that you want to put on your piece of paper is the water body. So that stream, river, or a lake. Um, and so once we fold this up, crumple it up, make our landscape like this, most of the time we can find that our water bodies like streams and lakes and marshes and estuaries, they're found in the low spots of the land. So take the marker, you can draw those in. I'm going to draw a couple extras in on my sheet here. So you can see them there. And when it rains, here's my rain. When it rains, water moves over that landscape and collects and on its way to move to the other water bodies. I'm trying to see if you can see it there. See? Now, if you take your other markers, and you can do it on the same piece of paper, or to minimize the drips in my office, I chose to do it on other, but you can add in some pollutants. So you may want, like I said, you may want to use a whole new sheet of paper where you can use the same one, but take different color markers, and you can pick some different pollutants. Um, or if you only have one other color, you can make them um, all the same color, but represent some other pollutants. So represent things like sediment, maybe coming from a construction site that you can see here in orange, or um, some pet weight pathogens from pet waste coming up here next to this, this lake. And so now if it rains, this is a very simple exercise, but now if it rains, this is gonna be a big rainstorm. You can start to see the colors are bleeding and running as they move in to um, the water bodies. So see how the colors run and how it gets washed into the water bodies polluting them? That's exactly how non-point source pollutants um, work as well. Those pollutants from various places across the landscape gather and move all into the water body becoming non-point source pollution. So I'm gonna go back and share my screen again. We move through that example quickly, but if you've got questions, we can certainly touch on them a little bit in a few minutes. So we want to keep these pollutants from getting into our water, right? So we need to actually do something about stormwater. 
one thing that a lot of people, lots of adults even, don't know is that as water moves across the land and goes into a storm drain like this one here, that drain is piped directly to the nearest water body. So when it goes down the drain, um, just as it would be moving across the landscape, it doesn't get cleaned up. It doesn't go to the wastewater treatment plant. It goes directly to the creek or the marsh, the ocean, a lake, but moves to the, the nearest water body, taking all of those pollutants with it. So what can we do? We've got to keep stormwater from getting to the drain. So over time, we've noticed that there's a relationship between the impervious surfaces those surfaces that can absorb the water um, and stormwater. And this image really helps us see that relationship. So if we start here on the, the left, focusing on this top left, you can see there are not many impervious surfaces in this picture. So about half or 50% of all the rain is actually making its way, it's being absorbed and infiltrated into the ground. So for you, for you big kids, that those percentages on the picture in the bottom, those are the percentage of where the um, of what rain goes where, and this is actually called a water balance. So you can follow the percentages along. So on the left hand side, as I mentioned, we have about half of that water making its way in the ground and only a little bit, 10% of it running off. But as we move from left to right and change the landscape, we have a bit more houses, we have more roads, more buildings, and the land becomes more urban we see only about 15% of that water making it into the ground and over half of it becoming stormwater runoff. Think about where you live. Are there lots of impervious surfaces? How much water do you think is actually going into the ground where, where you're from? So can we just make all the impervious surfaces go away? Nope. So what do we do? Most of our impervious surfaces make up what we call infrastructure. That's a pretty big word, but it's an important word. Infrastructure is all the structures and facilities. So think about buildings and roads and power supplies, all those things that we need to support society. We need infrastructure for, to support our communities. We use the buildings for our schools, for our homes, the places that our adults work, places to shop. So we need infrastructure. We can't just get rid of it. Um, but wait. We can still keep the pollutants from going down the drain. One of the ways that we can achieve that is to mimic nature, to copy it or imitate it using plants and soils, surfaces that allow water to infiltrate back into the ground. So these practices are collectively called green infrastructure. You can see a few examples here. There's permeable pavement up here. There's a green roof here on the top right. There's a swale here in the parking lot. There are lots of different kinds and types of green infrastructure. Some of them look very similar, but all of them mimic nature by capturing, storing, filtering, and infiltrating stormwater so that they, we can improve water quality. So let's do a quick recap. Stormwater is the rainwater or water from snow and ice that's not absorbed into the ground. And we care about it because there can be a lot of it, there can be a large quantity that causes flooding, but it can also move across the land and pick up pollutants that harm our water bodies. And green infrastructure mimics or copies nature to treat stormwater and improve water quality, keeping the rain from the drain. So we're gonna pause here for to see if there's a few questions. Maggie, do we have some questions in the chat? Yeah, yeah, and please type any questions you have for Jess in the chat right now. Um, we have one question so far, um, and this is from Carmen. Um, you mentioned a few slides ago, you had a picture of a storm drain with some trash um, on it, and then um, the next picture was uh, leading out into a water body. And Carmen wants to know, why are the storm drain holes so big? Why don't they make them smaller so trash can't get in? That's a good question, Carmen, and a very intuitive one. Um, some places are actually making the, the holes smaller so that the trash can't move in. But if, one of the things that, that our cities have learned, though, is if we make them so small that, our, that the trash gets stuck, it's much easier for the drains to get clogged. 
And so if someone's not actively cleaning and maintaining those drains to keep the things from clogging them, then we can actually create more flooding um, because the water has nowhere to go. Um, so there are people experience, are experimenting with the different sizes um, and uh, that is certainly one solution, but we have to make sure that we can maintain them and keep them clean. Yeah, great. Um, we also have a question from Robert um, and he asks, why do you want the water to be absorbed into the ground? Don't the pollutants just go into the ground? Ah, um, I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit more about this, Robert, but um, yes, the ground, the soil actually serves as a natural filter. So some of the pollutants do make it into the ground, and there are cases in which we have to be really careful to not transfer those pollutants directly to other um, sources like groundwater, which we might be able to, we might be getting our drinking water from. We don't actually want to um, move those pollutants through through soils to other to other places but soils are a great way to clean um up the pollutants so in in some ways the soils actually bind the pollutants together but there's also a lot of microbes in the soils that can uh, break down the pollutants and make them less harmful so the soils actually serve as our own natural filter yeah, but so, we do have to be careful about it for sure. Yeah, soil is really, really important. Um, great. Um, so Michelle is wondering um, why do people stencil drains? Ah, um, most of the time when they're stenciling, or you can see um, here in the picture, uh, th there's actually the um, the the drain cap. It's it is a way to help educate their the rest of the community to to let them know um, as i said before a lot of people don't know that that drain is directly connected to the water um, they think that 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 water is somehow getting treated and so most of our efforts to stencil or mark actually show are are helping to try to communicate to people don't put things that don't belong down the storm drain because that can um, really affect the water quality and the, the habitat downstream. So the fish, or if you um, like to paddleboard or canoe, um, you certainly don't want to be doing that in water that people have been dumping things down the storm drain. Perfect. Um, I'm gonna ask one more and then we'll have some time for questions a little bit later. Um, so Theodore asks, how does green infrastructure help animals and owls in particular? Oh, cool question. Yep, I'm hopefully going to be able to share a few specific examples, um, but green infrastructure can create some really great habitat. Um, and so most of the time when we think about habitat and green infrastructure, it's much uh, for smaller wildlife. So we're thinking about birds and pollinators. Um, but green infrastructure, particularly some of these larger practices in a community setting, which I'm going to share some examples of, can provide um, corridors to connect back to natural areas. So you may have green infrastructure that provides a flyover stop for owls as they're making their way to larger habitats, such as the forest. Great. Thank you, Jess. Um, we have a couple more questions, but I think I'm going to save them for right now and we'll have time for you to answer those at the end um, as you're gonna talk about green infrastructure more now. Super, yeah, we'll shift over to green infrastructure practices. And I first wanted to, to, to talk or share a few practices that we've been able to do at a community scale. So these are much larger practices, much larger projects, but there are some really great examples um, of some of the things that you all have asked about. And then we'll wrap up at the end with some green infrastructure practices that you can actually do at home. So the first one I wanted to share is permeable pavement. Permeable pavement um, are surfaces that, that at first glance look like impervious ones, right? So if you um, look at the picture on the bottom left, 
there, um, you'll see those actually look like bricks. Those are permeable pavers, but they have pores or little open space. You can see those, those holes there that allow the water to soak in. Or sometimes we can use a product like pervious concrete here in the video that allows the water to pass right through it. So here are some other videos of permeable pavement. In this first one here, you can see this installation crew putting in the pavers. But what you can also see is underneath there's a very large gravel stor storage layer, which can be a few feet thick. That storage layer serves as a holding tank for the stormwater while it soaks back into the ground. Um, and that gravel can also help filter out some of the pollutants and prevent flooding um, because it can store a lot of water. This second video uh, is, a is a great example of just how much permeable pav pavement can soak up and store. Sometimes people don't believe just how much. This video here is a video of a concrete truck full of water. It's currently dumping about 2,000 gallons. That's almost 50 bathtubs in just four minutes. And you can see the water just looks like it's disappearing because it's, it's infiltrating so quickly into the ground. Another practice is called rainwater harvesting. This is a really old practice um, that you can see all over the world. But here on the screen, you can see three cisterns or these three large tanks. This one here on the left, that's me. These are pretty big and they're used to store rainwater. By storing the rainwater, we keep it from picking up those non-point source pollutants and we can use it for other things. So like this one in the middle, they use that water to water the plants in the community garden. And this one on the right, it's actually used to wash off boats and gear coming in from the sea. So we're just repurposing by harvesting that rainwater, um, we're repurposing it um, and also allowing an opportunity for uh, that water to infiltrate based off how we're using it in another way. The last green infrastructure I would mention is actually bioretention, and this is my favorite. If you look really closely, you might see them in the parking lot of a big store like Walmart or Target. You, in some of our urban cities, you may see them along the road, um, but you have to look really close because they often blend in with the landscape. Bioretention is a shallow depression, so it's like a bowl that we redirect stormwater into and hold it when it rains. Underneath the bowl, we add special soils that help soak up and filter the pollutants out of the stormwater, cleaning it up before it moves deeper into the ground. And most of the time, these bioretention cells, they're planted with native plants, and they look a lot like a flower garden. Those plants can also use the stormwater and pull out nutrients, another common pollutant in stormwater, and use them for their own growth. So you can see in the picture here, we're actually capturing rainwater from this road, redirecting it into the bioretention cell here that's planted with all sorts of uh, vegetation and native plants. Here's a video of the city of Brunswick um, here in Georgia, digging out a bioretention cell, replacing the soil underneath. Um, and this is a time lapse of several days of construction. This is about a week of construction all zoomed up in one video. But you can see they build it just like a layer cake of rock and soil um, and more um, soils. And then later we came back and added the, the plants and the, the native vegetation there. You can see some of the team of people that came out to help um, plant the plants. Um, this person right here, this is actually my colleague, Karen Giovingo. She's a native plant specialist. She's an ecologist. Um, and so she was the one that designed and picked out all of the plants. And then these students were really helpful in helping us make sure that the system got planted. So thanks for letting me share a few examples. We can talk more about those if you have questions um, from those projects. But as I was sharing, did you notice any of the teams that I got to work with? Um, and feel free to take a minute and type some of the, the team players that might have helped create some of these green infrastructure projects. Yes, please put some thoughts in the chat of who you think what kind of uh, different groups and types of people are, are involved in these projects. Um, 
Texas thinks students, um, and Robert mentioned construction workers. Those are really good ones. Um, Theodore said anybody. Um, Nicole said gardeners or businesses, and, and Robert said gardeners. Um, oh, Sam said businesses, actually. Um, yeah, hopefully everybody. So lots of different groups of people who are could be involved in this. Yeah, these are lots of great answers. Another Michelle saying gardener, Robert builders. Yes, lots of great answers. That's great. Yeah, so the entire community can be involved um, in, especially in projects uh, that will serve as an example um, for, for the rest of the communities. So um, now it's going to be your turn. We're going to switch gears and talk about um, some of the things that you can potentially do at home or school. But I want you to continue to be thinking about who's on your team and make sure that you talk to your adults, so parents, grandparents, teachers, before you try to take on any one of these projects. All right. Um, they, the people on your team might actually be interested in learning um, too, and they may have some expertise. They may be gardeners um, or have some construction background, and they can they can help out. So um, we're going to talk about some green infrastructure practices that you could use at home or school. But first, let's think about how much water do you or your family use at home. Um, think about all the different ways that you use water, uh, and type in your guesses uh, in gallons of water per year into the chat? Yeah, so this is a tough question, um, but just try to think about, if you were to guess, how many gallons of water do you think your house uses in a year? Um, Nicole says 3,000. Um, Barbara is saying 5,000. Robert says 20,000 gallons. Dominic is saying 5,000. Theodore says 50 million gallons. Um, Michelle is saying 6,000. Texas is saying 50,000. So a range from 3,000 to 50 million. Um, wow, 50 million is a lot. Um, that's, a, that's also a really good range. But on average, in, in the US, a household uses 146,000 gallons of water per year. So somewhere actually kind of right in the middle for what you all are guessing, 146,000 gallons. That's almost five swimming pools. Um, and most, oh, almost half of that water is actually um, on average going to be used outside. So in the landscape around your home. Um, a lot of water. So what can we do in our own landscape? Um, the first thing that you can do, and we've been talking about it all alone, all along, but keeping the rain from the drain by disconnecting your impervious surfaces. So here in the schematic, you can see this house, we're using a house, this could also be a driveway, think of any impervious surface, but we can, if we have um, homes or buildings, that have gutters and downspouts, sometimes those pipes can be directly connected to the drain. Or even if they're not directly connected, like in the figure, we oftentimes have them directed to another impervious surface, like a driveway or a sidewalk. And so that downspout shoots out water, um, taking water from the rooftop directly to another impervious surface, like a sidewalk, a driveway, or the road. So there's a pretty simple fix. You can disconnect them and reroute that water to a surface that'll absorb or infiltrate the water. If you have downspouts or these pipes that come down from your gutters, you can add this section of flexible pipe, which is less than $10, and redirect the stormwater to the yard or landscape area. I actually have one here. Let's see, it's just a plain pipe. Um, and again, talk to your adults about where you want the water to go and make sure to not be putting water back toward the building. But you can treat up 85% of the stormwater at home 
by simply just keeping the stormwater on site and infiltrating it and soaking it up in your, your yard or the associated green space. So this is true if you live in an apartment or a multifamily unit too, um, just redirecting that water into the green um, to the community green space. The next practice that you might use is actually called a rain barrel. Rain barrels are like mini cisterns. Remember those big tanks that I had on the screen? Um, unless you live in a really big housing complex, you won't be able to use all of the water that a sister can, cistern can collect. It can collect thousands of gallons. But we can use rain barrels to collect water from, from the rooftop. And we can use that water in a variety of ways. We can use it to water plants, to wash the dog or the car. Um, there's lots of different ways that we can use uh, and repurpose that rainwater. And it's a bonus if you're actually using it to wash something off outside to direct that water after you wash it off into the yard or some other landscaped area. You can buy a rain barrel um, at Home Depot or Lowe's, but one of my favorite things to do is ask around in your community to see if there's a rain barrel workshop. Oftentimes companies like Coca-Cola will donate syrup barrels that need that can be cleaned and recycled and used as a rain barrel. So got some examples of those on the screen. A workshop is a really great way to learn about all the different parts of a rain barrel and make one with friends and family so they can learn about it too. Did you know a 55 gallon rain barrel can save most homeowners 16, are 1,650 gallons of water per year. And so instead of paying for potable water or water that you would get out of the tap, um, you can use a rain barrel uh, to water the landscape, save money and conserve water. The last practice I'll share with you that you can do at home um, or even at your school is a rain garden. And a rain garden is like the kid sister or the little brother of a bioretention cell. Rain gardens, like bioretention, are shallow depressions. They're, they're bowl-shaped features that we um, dig out and then plant with native plants. We'll route stormwater. So you can see here, again, we're using our same, the same building, the same house. Um, we'll direct the stormwater into the rain gardens. So over the next day or so, following the rainstorm, they allow the water to slowly soak back into the ground. Again, we wanna make sure to locate them in between our impervious surfaces. So in between the building shown here and the driveway and the road where the drain is. Rain gardens provide lots of benefits. Um, we've already touched a little bit on, on habitat, but in addition to being pretty and soaking up the water, they can be habitat for lots of local wildlife like birds and pollinators. Um, to put one in the ground, you may need a few extra tools and some friends and family to help you create it, but there are some resources and links that I've shared um, that'll help you get started. Speaking of getting started, how much stormwater can you keep from the drain? Here's some homework for the big kids. You can find out how much stormwater by first finding out what the square footage is or the area of the surface you will collect stormwater from. So that could be a rooftop of your home or your school or the square footage of a driveway or the road. You can use an online tool like Google Earth or you can go outside and measure the length and width on the ground. So once you have that number, that area, you can multiply it by 0.623, which converts that area to gallons for a typical rainfall event. So a, a typical rainfall event, meaning one inch of water. You can even take it a step further and then look up your average rainfall and multiply it to determine how much stormwater you generate in a year. So for example, here in coastal Georgia, where I'm at, there is the potential to harvest an average of 30,900 gallons every year for, of rainfall from an 1,000 square foot rooftop, which is not a very big um, roof. So 
So thanks for tuning in today. I hope that you've learned about some ways that you can copy nature and use green infrastructure to keep the rain from the drain. Uh, make sure that you find your team and get outside and take a look around where you might uh, where you might see some areas that you can put some stormwater green infrastructure um, or you might actually see some already in your landscape. I think we've got a few more questions. So I'm gonna pause here and Aggie, do we have some questions in the chat? We do, yes. And please feel free to keep adding questions. Um, so yeah, we do have a few questions. And if we don't get to your question right now, don't worry. Uh, Jess is gonna answer those later and we'll post the answers on our website um, soon with the recording. Um, so uh, someone whose name is SM, I'm not sure what their full name is, but they're asking about issues with storing water and collecting water and then attracting, like creating high levels of humidity or causing issues with mosquitoes. Um, so they're wondering how can the presence of mosquitoes be minimized while still providing green water infrastructure? That's a really good question. And it's actually the number one question that I get when I talk to communities is how do we make sure um, that we're not attracting unwanted um, wildlife or un adverse effects? So, and mosquitoes is, is a big one. Um, so when we're talking about rainwater harvesting, like a rain barrel, we want to make sure that we use the water frequently and so that we don't have as much standing water in the barrel. We use a mesh net over the top um, and also over the, the holes where the connections are uh, to make sure that mosquitoes are not moving in. Um, and then one extra tip that I like um, to always suggest, because mosquitoes can be really bad here in coastal Georgia, is if you take just a tablespoon of vegetable oil, um, which is safe for the landscape, and put it in, um, it breaks up the surface tension um, on the top of the water in the rain barrel so that the mosquitoes can't actually um, lay their eggs and become in the barrel bee mosquito habitat. For other types of green infrastructure, um, so bioretention, permeable pavement, some of the other practices that I mentioned, those are actually designed, that's part of the engineering of, of designing those systems to draw down the water within two days. Um, and so with mosquitoes, they actually need water that is still for up to three to five days for their um, eggs to hatch. And so as long as that water is drawing down and moving into the soil in the two days, and so if it's designed properly, you won't actually have a mosquito issue with your green infrastructure. Good question. Yeah, that's really interesting. I did know that vegetable oil trick. Um, <laughs> um, Robert has a question. Um, he's wondering, are certain plants better than others for bioretention? Mm, yes. So. You might have picked up, I, I mentioned the use of native plants. And so native plants are adapted to your local landscape. So we're using plants that are native to your region. Um, and they're going to be better suited to handle drought um, or uh, lots, uh, lots of rain. So if you have a summer that's particularly wet, those native plants are going to adapt a little bit better um, than other, land, other plants that you might find um, at uh, the local uh, landscape store or uh, like Lowe's or Home Depot. So look for, for native plants in your area. There's there are several resources um, where you can search for, for native, native plants. There's lots of different colors and varieties, um, bushes and trees and all sorts of different shapes and sizes of native plants that you can select for the rain garden or the bioretention cell. Um, one of the things that is not as important for bioretention, um, but some of the other practices really have to pick plants that like wet feet. Um, and so in addition to being native, you may also want plants that have, um, that are more suited for a wetland environment. But that information you can find uh, for pretty much every plant that's out there. So just um, be mindful of where the plant's going to be placed um, 
and if it's in the base it may actually like to have a little bit wetter feet but most any most any plant will do some will just be better suited so those native plants are going to be better suited to to handle the conditions of the green infrastructure that's great that's really helpful um i'm going to ask one more question there's a few more we'll have you answer those later jess but one more today um, Kevin asks, are there resources to get rain barrels for low income households? Yes, there are. And so I mentioned to take a look for some of those community workshops. And if you reach out to um, your, your C Grant college or university, they may have some resources, but Cooperative Extension is another great, so your local Cooperative Extension agent in the county in which you live is will be another great resource to connect you to um, for, for local rain barrel workshops. Oftentimes, uh, they provide uh, discounts, and particularly for low-income housing, you can find uh, discounts or even rain barrels that you can pick up for free. That's great. Um, thank you so much. And thank you for all of those questions. Um, and thank you, Jess, for an amazing talk today. I think we all learned a lot and we can now share our new knowledge with our friends and family. So thank you. Um, so please, everyone, stay tuned for a post webinar survey. Um, we'd love to get your feedback and um, also for more information on past and upcoming webinars or to receive a NOAA Live iron-on patch, um, please visit our website at Woods Hole Sea Grants. And we look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar, which will be on November 3rd, a Wednesday, and it's gonna be all about crabs, so we're very excited. So thank you again, Jess, thank you, Crystal, and we hope you all have a great rest of your day. Bye.